Our next speaker for the evening is Professor Jack Price from the Institute of Psychiatry uh, in King's College, London. Um, I met Jack. Well, I met Jack for the first time this evening, but I've been listening to his um, University of the Third Age lectures on building the human brain, which he tells me he's going to be giving again next year. And um, uh, it's a, a cracking set of lectures, really very revealing. Um, so if I'm, I know that some of you are members of U3AC here, so um, do go along. Um, um, he's published it in a, a, a lot of his work in a book, and I don't normally plug books, but I'm I'm going to plug it now. Can you see me? I don't... Yeah, um, fantastic book. Um, the Future of Brain Repair, A Realist's Guide to Stem Cell Therapy. And that's very good because lots of um, realism in there, I would say. Um, so Jack's primary interest is in stem cells and their capacity to repair the human brain. Um, he was director of the UK Stem Cell Bank and um, head of the Division of Advanced Therapies at the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control is a very interesting organization. If you Google for NIBSC, you'll find some fantastic things that uh, our organization, uh, organizations in the UK are doing. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Jack. Come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, um, and thank you to you all for the invitation to uh, come and speak. It's a great pleasure. It's always a great pleasure to come to Cambridge, um, and it's uh, great to go have this opportunity to speak about uh, this topic. Uh, let me start with a, a, a um, uh, sort of bold declaration. I um, uh, worked for many years as a, as a consultant. Uh, for, whoops. Oh, dear. This is tricky, isn't it? There we go. Um, for a company called Renuron, um, who are a stem cell, small stem cell company. And some of the work I'll be talking about today was actually done in collaboration uh, with them. Um, so uh, with that, let me just uh, get on and tell you about what I'm going to tell you about. So um, uh, stem cells uh, and stem cell therapies. So stem cell therapies are already here. Uh, Here's just a couple of examples. Bone marrow stem cells uh, have existed for really quite a few years for treating various immunological uh, problems, such as uh, this, this child here with uh, 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 a genetic deficit and, uh, uh, and, and the consequences of that. CAR T cells are a much, a much newer uh, cell therapy, uh, making a dramatic uh, change to the treatment of a number of different cancers and very much uh, a, a sort of a hot topic, as I, I understand you had a, a talk about it quite recently, and it's a very exciting field. So stem cell therapies are here. Uh, they're making a difference to, to human health now. Uh, but none of the examples up there uh, are for brain disorders. And the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, there has yet to be an approved stem cell therapy for any brain disorder, not only in the United Kingdom, but in Europe, in America, in, the, in, in Japan, in no jurisdiction is there yet an approved uh, stem cell therapy for a brain disorder. And that might strike you as odd, because if you've been paying attention for the last 10, 20, 30 years, you can't have failed to have heard all the hype around stem cell therapies. And perhaps at this moment, you're thinking, what, haven't they got there yet? And you'd be very much entitled to think that, I would say. So what I want to do uh, really today is, is talk uh, on this topic, and I'm going to split the subject into three sections. First of all, I'm going to talk about what I've called uh, the legacy therapies. And these are therapies that I might have been here 20, 30 years ago telling you about how we've just got this exciting new project and how it's going to make an enormous difference. And most of those projects that were first in the clinic 10, 20 years ago are now completing their clinical trials and we know how well they've worked. Um, and you'll see in a moment, the answer to that is not very well. So what have we learned from that? Where do we go next? Um, I'm next gonna take a bit of an, uh, an excursion and talk about what I call feral therapies. So that there's a lot of consequences of the, 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 the first legacy therapies that really are somewhat undesirable. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the things that are out there you might wanna think about avoiding. 
um, uh, the, some of the sort of wilder stuff that's going on in this domain. Anyway, to finish on, a, on, a, on an optimistic note, I'm gonna then tell you about some of the newer stuff and how we've solved some of the problems that faced us in the past. And hey, dare I say it, there's some exciting things coming through now. And who knows whether they'll work, but I must say I'm much more optimistic than I was when I wrote that book. <laughs> um, so um, let me start just uh, with then with the legacy therapists, as, as I've said, and, and let me start simply with a, a definition. Um, so we, we all know what we're talking about. So stem cells are cell, cells that by and large give rise to other cells. So uh, stem cells, particularly adult stem cells, true stem cells are cells that have a potential. They have a developmental potential to, to generate cells of whatever other cell type. So for neural stem cells, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, um, they give rise to brain cells, neurons clear that, that make up the brain. Um, uh, other stem cells you will have heard of, I, I just referred to uh, some of the uh, bone marrow stem cells, uh, and, and they're the cells that, that give rise to blood so that you never run out of blood. You always have a population of stem cells generating red blood cells, white blood cells. And it's obvious from that example why you need stem cells. You obviously need to be able to produce blood or skin or intestinal mucosa or any other of these sites where you've got stem cell populations. And that gives rise to the second seminal property. So that one is they, they give rise to other cell types. So they're multipotential and use the terminology. But their other seminal property is they, they, they generate more cells like themselves. So they're self-replicative. And the obvious reason for that is you don't ever want to run out of stem cells. You don't want to run out of blood. So you don't want to run out of the stem cells that make blood. Okay. So true stem cells tend to have these, these properties. So um, uh, th this idea, once neural stem cells had been discovered, and it took a long time for us to, to find there really were such things. For many years, it was kind of denied by neuroscientists. But once we discovered there were such things, um, the question arose, could you use them the same way as hematologists use bone marrow stem cells? So uh, it, it, a, 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 a patient who's, who's, for whatever reason, not got the bone marrow stem cells they need, either because they've been a subject of disease or because they've been deleted uh, therapeutically, you put stem cells back to replace the ones they've lost, right? So that they can generate more blood cells, right? Well, could you do the same in the brain? In disorders where, where neural cells have been lost, neurons and glia have been lost through disease or damage. Could you put stem cells back in and get them to make new brain cells? Now, that might sound like a silly idea, and it is. It's a silly idea because that, that isn't something that's normally going on. So in the adult bone marrow, the generation of blood cells is ongoing, right? But in the brain, apart from a couple of very peculiar regions, this doesn't happen. Most of the brain cells in your head you've had since before you were born. And there's very, very little regeneration of new uh, brain cells going on in the human brain. So the idea you could put stem cells in there and they kind of know what to do in a completely different milieu from where it normally takes place in the fetus seems pretty unlikely, but hey, Somebody had the idea, so we thought we'd have a go. So the model I'm going to tell you about first is this one. So you'll be familiar, all of you, with stroke. So a stroke, well, a stroke comes in two different forms. There's a hemorrhagic stroke where a blood vessel bursts and there's a loss of blood. The more common form, about 80, 90 percent of strokes, are actually the type shown here. And this is what we call ischemic stroke. And that's when uh, a blood vessel gets blocked, typically by an, an embolus, a, a, blown, a, a blood clot or some such similar. And as a consequence, a whole area of brain tissue, uh, sorry, I'm in trouble manipulating this pointer. Let's try again. There we go. A whole area of brain tissue is deprived of, uh, of its blood supply. And as a consequence, it dies. And it gets cleared away and you end up with a fluid filled cyst. So you literally have water where you should have brain. And you don't have to be a radiologist to spot where the stroke has been on this poor individual. So you can see immediately something's gone terribly wrong here. And, and the whole chunk of brain tissue has been, has, has been lost. So what if we were to put stem cells in or somewhere around the perimeter of this area of damage? Could they go in? Could they rebuild the brain tissue that's been lost? Well, until you try, you don't know, right? 
So you obviously don't start with patients, you start with animals. Yes, yeah, sorry, that's the, so can you inject stem cells into the brain and bring about repair? So uh, rats are our favorite uh, model of stroke. So rats have uh, exactly, the, the, the artery that most commonly gets blocked in humans is something we call the middle cerebral artery. And rats have a middle cerebral artery as well, and you can block it experimentally. You feed a little thread up through the carotid and into the, um, um, oops, sorry, I nearly lost my glass then. Um, right there. Um, uh, into the middle cerebral artery and, and, uh, uh, and, and block it. And if you do that, then the poor old rat gets a stroke very, very similar to what I've just shown you in a human. And you can immediately see this rat's lost. It's got a cyst here where there should be brain tissue. It's lost about 60% of this one hemisphere. So the experiment then is, can we inject cells, stem cells in the vicinity of this stroke and bring about the replacement of, of the lost tissue? And the cells we used for this experiment are cells uh, that we call CTXOEO3. And what they simply are, I'm not going to tell you how we made them because it's old technology now, but basically what they are, are cells derived from an aborted human fetus. So we just dissected out the cerebral cortex from an aborted human fetus. And from them, we use various genetic techniques to generate an immortalized uh, stem cell line. And that's the cell line that we used for, for this study. So what we've done then is we've injected these CTXOEO3 cells into the vicinity of this stroke. And what we're asking is, can we make an improvement in the animal's behavior? Okay, the animal, just as a stroke patient, a human stroke patient suffers from functional uh, uh, disability as a consequence of the stroke, so does the rat. And we bring about a reversal of that structural, uh, that, that disability by the introduction of these stem cells. So we did various experiments on these rats to find out if we could, if, if injecting the stem cells could help in any way. I'm only going to give you the data from one experiment, and this is what we call the sticky tape test. So what we do in the sticky tape test is we wrap parcel tape around the animal's forepaws. Now, if you do that to a normal rat, it doesn't like it very much, and the rat rips it off pretty damn quick. And because rats aren't particularly handed, it rips it off the left paw at the same rate as it rips, rips it off the right paw, okay? So if you look then at animals that are unlesioned and ask, is there any symmetry, right, left, is asymmetry in the rate at which they take them off the two paws, the answer is there, there isn't. So for unlesioned animals, uh, uh, th there is there's zero asymmetry, okay? Right and left are the same. But if you look at these animals that have had the stroke, now you see, and this is the, the, the blue line, now you see a, a dramatic difference right to left. And it's obvious why that is, because the poor old rat can no longer feel the poor on the afflicted side, side contralateral to the stroke. And even if it can feel it, it's much less able to pull the paw to its mouth to tear off the tape. So it's much slower that side than on the control side. And that gives you this asymmetry that we're able to measure. So the question then is, if that's a measure of disability, can we reverse that disability, okay, by adding the stem cells? And that's what's shown on the red line. So these are animals that have had the stroke. So now they've got the asymmetry that I've just talked about. And you can see for the first, I don't know, four weeks after the stroke, after, excuse me, after the engraftment, uh, uh, there's, there's um, uh, no real change. But in the four weeks following that, between four and eight weeks, there's a dramatic improvement. So by eight weeks, there is effectively no difference right to left. These animals, at least for this parameter, are indistinguishable from control animals that never had the stroke. Okay. Now, there's two things to say about this result. The first is that it's a robust finding. So we've done this experiment many times and it always works. But more importantly, experiments like this were being done in lots of laboratories worldwide at the same time, using different models of stroke, models of traumatic brain injury, various other uh, models of, of, of brain damage. And this was a consistent finding. Uh, so, so this is a reliable, robust result. The second thing to say about it is it's decidedly non-trivial. There are no other agents out there, at least none that I know of, that can bring about this kind of functional improvement, this kind of improvement of disability in an animal, a mammal, this severely disabled as a consequence of, a, of an injury like a stroke. Okay, 
So whatever else, there's something really important here. You put stem cells into a badly damaged brain and you see a dramatic improvement functionally, okay? So we were pretty pleased with that, as you can imagine. But there's a problem. Isn't there always a problem? The problem was the cells had worked and you get this improvement, but you might have noticed that I haven't shown you any pictures of new neurons and glia being formed by the engrafted cells. And the reason I haven't shown you that is because there weren't any, okay? The hypothesis you remember was these cells are multipotential, they can generate neurons and glia, replace the ones that have been lost, right? What I'm telling you is you get this dramatic functional improvement, but there are no new glia or neurons, at least non-generated by the engrafted cells, right? So the problem is that the, the cells work, but not the way we intended. So we've done a lot, we and lots of other labs have done a lot of work over a number of years trying to work out what on earth is going on then. And the answer at this present moment, several, after several years of, of effort, is that we still don't really know. But we, we don't not know because we can't find the stem cells doing anything. We don't not know because, we don't know because everything we look at has changed. You engraft stem cells into the damaged brain and almost, everything you subsequently look at, or at least everything we looked at, is improved. The, the, the brain makes more blood vessels. It, it modulates its own intrinsic immunology. The brain has cells called microglia, which are their own resident uh, 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 macrophages uh, and sort of immunologically active cells. Their behavior changes. So you see a modulation of the behavior of the endogenous stem cells, the stem cells the, the rat already had, their behavior is altered. And various other things which we lump together, we call neurotrophic mechanisms, which is a hand-waving way of saying things change and we don't really know what's going on. So the, the conclusion is the stem cells don't replace the neurons in glia, but they do a damn lot of other things. Certainly lots goes on when you inject stem cells into a damaged brain. Okay, and this result was one of a number that, that sort of convinced us that we've been kind of looking at stem cells the wrong way. We always define cells the way I've just started off describing them to you as, as cells that have a certain potential, a certain developmental potential. But what this says is these are cells that are very, very sensitive to the environment in which you put them and they respond accordingly. Okay, we don't know how or why or what's going on precisely, but needless to say, it's an important <laughs> discovery. Now, um, this result uh, provoked uh, quite a debate in the neuroscience community uh, because the cells that we'd made, those ctx 3 cells, were human cells, and that we actually made them to clinical grade. So as you'll be aware, any, any medicinal product has to be made to certain standards dictated by the MHRA, the medicines regulator. We'd made those cells to, to meet those standards. So theoretically, those cells, those very same cells, could go into the brains of patients, okay? And we were quite keen to do that, to run a clinical trial. But we met up with quite a lot of opposition. A lot of our neuroscience colleagues were saying, yeah, okay, so it works, but you don't know how it works. You're on dangerous ground. We need to back off until we understand what's going on here, okay? And in fact, the MRC, who'd been involved, not specifically with our research, but a number of other projects along the same lines, called a special conference in the QE2 center in, you know, in Westminster. And a whole load of us got together to discuss it. And these various views were expressed backwards and forwards. Um, in the end, there was no firm decision made, but we decided we would ask the medicines regulator for permission to go ahead. And I agreed with that decision. And um, the reason why I thought it was ethical was because I thought, and still believe actually, that it would not be ethical to withhold a therapy like this. We've just tested these cells on the best stroke model that we have, an approved stroke model approved by the medicines regulator. And it worked, worked better than anything anybody else has ever tried. Would it be ethical to say to stroke patients, well, we're not quite sure about how it works. We just wanna hang on and do another 20 years worth of experiments to find out. It's a difficult decision, but anyway, we applied to the MHRA for permission to go ahead. And sure enough, uh, it was granted. Actually, um, I should say that when we 
presented the data I've just shown you uh, uh, to the MHRA, they said they didn't believe it, and they told us to go away and do it again. And in fact, the results I've just shown you was our repeat of, of what we first showed them. So eventually they agreed. And in uh, November, well, November 2010, we announced this, the trial. It started in 2011. And it was, in fact, the first trial, at least this side of the Atlantic, for, of a stem cell therapy for a, for a brain disorder. So uh, that trial is now concluded. It went through a number of phases. This is kind of what it looked like. You, you put a stereotactic apparatus around a person's head, you drill a hole, actually several holes, and you put several deposits of these stem cells around the area of the, uh, of the stroke lesion. Needless to say, you've imaged the brain carefully first to know exactly where the stroke is and exactly where you need to go. Um, and so that's what happened. So the, uh, after two years, the, we, we got the first, uh, the, the first trial data. Um, th so this is, is what's usually called a phase one, phase two. As you'll be aware, the first stage of any clinical trial is a safety trial. You, you're not powering the trial for efficacy, to detect efficacy. You're, just, you're mainly looking for safety uh, results. But nonetheless, we obviously measured for efficacy. And these are one of the sets of data. Again, we, we, we looked at a number of different parameters. So what you're looking at here is each one of these lines is a patient over the 24 months of the, of the, of the trial. And what, what you're looking at on the y-axis is, is a measure of disability. I won't go into the specifics of that, but you're measuring stroke disability. And what you can see is that broadly, each of the patients was fairly stable before the trial. In fact, patients were selected precisely for that. They, they, to, to be, we only took patients that were stable uh, before the, 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 uh, the injection of the cells. But what you can then see without going into masses of detail is that broadly, each one of these lines to a greater or lesser extent goes downwards. In other words, each one of these patients showed some improvement, some very modest. You can see this one up here is a very slight improvement, some much more dramatic. Encouraging. There was no question we were very encouraged by these data. So we went back to the agency and asked for permission to conduct a much bigger phase two trial. And that's what we did. And I'm not going to show you the results of that in detail because they're quite complicated. But let me just give you the bottom line. The bottom line was, Following a strategic review, the randomized placebo control phase 2B data uh, uh, of, of the CTX stem cell therapy for stroke disability has been terminated early with the decision to progress stroke disability program through other collaborations. In other words, when we did the bigger trial with the placebo control arm, it didn't work. There was no difference between the experimental and the control arms of the trial. Okay, we weren't the only ones. There's another company, more or less at the same time as we were doing this study, but in the United States, a company called Sandbio, uh, based at Stanford University in, on the West Coast. They had different cells, but again, a, a stem cell line. They put it into into a stroke patients very very similar to ours. They are. Phase one data were, were better than ours, if anything. They were very, very good. They had one patient who'd been in a wheelchair and got up out of the wheelchair after the injection of the cells. Okay, This particular lady wasn't quite so badly afflicted, but she showed dramatic improvement as well. But again, when they did the full trial, there we go. Um, when they did the full trial, the top line results indicated that this that, that was their cell line, SB623, was not able to meet the primary endpoint regarding efficacy. So their cells didn't work either. Uh, this is a paper published by Caesar Belongan, so who was a stem, uh, excuse me, a stroke expert, and he reviewed all the data from these two trials and a number of other trials that were going on, trying to understand what, what had happened, what had gone wrong. And he identified a number of things, um, and, and I, I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but, but except to say that a thousand things went wrong. What this has told us is something we've known for donkey's years, that you can't simply extrapolate from a preclinical or even an early clinical study and expect it to pan out perfectly when you do a larger trial. There's a lot of, there's a thousand variables, and it's hard to control each one of them. You know, how many cells do you put? Where do you put them? It, are the patients equivalent? The rats, needless to say, are healthy young rats. Okay, they've had a stroke, but they were healthy prior to that. That's seldom the case with stroke patients, human stroke patients. They have a lot of other uh, pathologies, a, a, a lot of comorbidities. Okay, 
what Belonging did say, though, and I think this is one of the take home messages, is that in his opinion, uh, the regulator insisted that we use far too few cells. He reckons that most of the trials, including ours, probably used at least two orders of magnitude fewer cells than would be probably needed to bring about a function improvement. Okay. So um, this was all very disappointing. You could say, well, you could go back in and do other studies, increase the cell dose, try, try and select different subpopulations of patients. And we probably would have done that, except that as I'm gonna go on and tell you about in a few moments, there were better, better cells around. So the cell biology had moved on and that's what I wanna move on to in a moment. So, so the, these legacy therapies, and I should say I've, I've concentrated on stroke, but there's been similar findings in a number of different conditions, traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, a whole series of other things where very good early data has not been maintained when the thing has gone to a full trial. So these legacy therapies have provided evidence for a novel mode of action. There's no question just from the rodent data that, that something's happening, but they've largely failed in large clinical trials and neither the preclinical nor early clinical data have proved predictive. So that's what I wanna say about the legacy therapies. And I wanna come on in a few moments and talk about what, I'm, what I've called the, 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 the uh, um, sort of more, kind of more rational therapies. Um, but first, let me just have a little bit of an excursion and talk about what I've been calling feral, feral therapies, because, OK, the trials that I've just told you about ultimately failed, but that whole body of work has had an unfortunate side effect. So many of you will recall when some of these first data were starting to appear, you saw pictures of rats getting up and walking where they previously couldn't. They had a big impact. Uh, lots of people paid attention. And needless to say, lots of people with desperate conditions suddenly thought this hope here, these cells could really, really help. And in the years when our, uh, our study was ongoing, I, I lost count of the number of emails and letters I got from so-and-so saying, my wife's had a stroke, can she enroll on your trial? A lot of desperate people out there wanted access to these medicines. Unfortunately, a lot of clinics sprung up that didn't do clinical trials, but just went ahead with cell therapies, even though they knew that our cells, promising that they'd appeared, had failed in full clinical trials. And needless to say, all the other trials, they were very well aware had failed. But they knew desperate people were prepared to sign up and pay for, for experimental therapies, particularly if there were stem cells, because, hey, stem cells are magic, right? So there was a huge take up and a huge number of clinics appeared worldwide. Um, I, so what, what I want to do is very, I'm, I don't want to talk in very general terms. I want to, I want to just very, very quickly uh, make a couple of summary arguments. And then just uh, I want to indicate what's happening currently in relation to one specific case study. So first, let me just show you this. So in the United States, you're probably aware that obviously they don't have socialized medicine such we have here. And the way things normally work here, where you go and see your GP and get referred on to a hospital doctor or specialist, generally tends not to work quite the same way in the United States. And there's a lot of what uh, people call direct to consumer uh, uh, access and medicines. People log online, find a clinic, sign up and get, and get, and, and get treated. Uh, this is from a paper by Lee Turner and his colleagues. Um, and each of these dots is a clinic in the United States that are offering unlicensed therapy basically to anybody who turns up. And a lot of them are using the same cells for a list of 20, 30, 50 different conditions. Okay, anything from orthopedic to uh, problems with eyes, with brains, with you name it. Uh, some of them even are almost funny. Uh, there was a, a guy turned up in a, a clinic in, in Florida, uh, in the A&E clinic, apparently having a stroke. It transpired that he, that was the consequence of him having had a stem cell injection into his, get this, into his scalp to cure his baldness. You're tempted to laugh, aren't you, if it wasn't quite so serious. So that's going on. I don't want to talk more about that, although I'm quite happy to, to take questions. But I just wanted to draw your attention to, to um, one particular thing that I find particularly troubling. And um, forgive me if I start to rant halfway through this one. Um, so what, what's autism got to do with stem cell therapy? Well, let's just quickly remind ourselves that autism is a behavioral condition very, very common, one to 2% of, of children uh, uh, are diagnosed with autism, typically age two, three, four. Um, 
it's got a very complex pathophysiology and I'm not going to go into it in detail except to say that it's very strongly genetic. It runs in families. About a thousand genes have now been identified as being risk genes for autism. Some of them very severely risk genes. There's some genes that if you have a mutation in that gene, you have an 80% chance of being diagnosed with autism. Right? But it's also got an environmental component. And one of the things that I still find slightly shocking um, is if mum has uh, influenza, and I mean influenza, I don't mean just a case of the sniffles, you know, a serious influenza that has, requires medical treatment. But if mum has influenza during her first trimester, she has an almost threefold increase of giving birth to a child or subsequently get a diagnosis of autism. And that's influenza. It's, with the, some of the more pathogenic viruses, it's much greater, six, eight, ten-fold increased risk. Okay. So that's really quite shocking, I think. Um, fortunately, we understand pretty well what's going on there. And it turns out, particularly in the case of influenza, um, that it's not the flu virus itself that's doing it. In fact, the flu virus doesn't cross the placenta. So the, the fetus isn't exposed to the flu virus. But what does happen is, of course, the mother mounts a response to the flu virus, mounts a, a pro-inflammatory response. Her immune system secretes cytokines into her bloodstream. They rush around making a temperature rise, sickness behavior, the whole nine yards that we're very familiar with when we have a, a bad cold or a flu. And it turns out some of those cytokines, some of those soluble messages going around a bloodstream, some of them do cross the placenta and, are, and, the, and the fetus is exposed. And we now understand in quite a lot of detail some of the biochemistry of what goes on when the fetus is exposed to some of these cytokines. And it turns out it's that exposure that increases the child's risk of going on to get autism. And there's a lot of biology around that that I don't have time to talk about now. But the reason for raising it is, is because that finding, plus a number of others, are, uh, uh, are the reason why, for a lot of people, and me included, be believe there's an immunological component to autism. So, for example, if mum has an immunological disorder, uh, 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 an autoimmune disease, for example, a risk of having a, a child who goes on to get autism is increased. So there, there, it almost certainly is an immunological component to, to autism. Um, but it's enormously heterogeneous almost certainly it only applies to a subset of, of autism patients. Um, th there's enormous variability in, in any of the parameters that I've just described uh, in, in terms of uh, bet between uh, autistic individuals. And importantly, there are no biomarkers for this immunological change, whatever it might be. And also note, I, I've said that the mum gets an immunological reaction and the baby gets exposed, but that hardly means that three, five, ten years later, there's still an immunological disturbance. It could have been, have been causal in terms of generating the disorder or the condition, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's still there detectable. And as I've said, there are no biomarkers. But this argument has been strong enough to direct some uh, clinicians uh, to undertake cell therapy for autism, because one of the things we know about cell uh, about stem cells, and I referred to it in our stroke data, is that it can be immunomodulatory. Okay, I, I told you in our rats we see altered behavior of the microglia, the sort of resident immunological cells in the brain. Right, so it kind of makes sense that, that stem cells could have a function. So a lot of clin the clinics I was just telling you about, one of the conditions they will treat is if you bring your child along, they'll inject them with stem cells to treat their autism. Um, uh, and, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's totally unjustified and wrong. But one of the things that's kind of interesting is this particular case study. So um, you could say, well, why don't these people, if they believe in this therapy, why don't they do a proper clinical trial? Well, the answer to that is obvious. They know it would fail. Right. And of course, there's providing this, they're selling this therapy. You go to the clinic, they don't do it for nothing. You pay for the therapy. So it's a nice little learning. You're going to risk it on a trial that might well fail. But there are trials, there are genuine trials. And a couple of the trials in question arise uh, from Duke University, which, as you're probably well aware, is a, a, a university medical school in, in, in Carolina, a very good one. Uh, and they did a trial, this lady. Uh, uh, 
uh, Dawson and, and this other lady, Joanna Kreutzberg, um, uh, conducted the trial. And guess what? When they did the trial, this is with cord blood infused into, into uh, autistic children. The conclusion was uh, it's safe and feasible, uh, but, but it didn't work. There was no change in autistic behavior. Uh, the, the only improvement they saw is the kind of improvement you generally see in autistic kids anyway. All right. So it didn't work. OK, so you think, well, they'll drop it. Well, they didn't drop it. Um, they did another trial. Um, so again, it's, it's again, same authors, Geraldine Dawson, Joanna Kreutzberg is the other senior author. Uh, again, cord blood infused. And this is a large trial. I mean, look at the numbers here. So she's got 180 children aged two to seven years. Uh, receiving these intravenous uh, 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 cord blood cells. And the result, uh, the single infusion was not associated with improved socialization skills or reduced autism symptoms, okay? Again, it failed. There was no difference between the control group and the experimental group. So, you know, they'd give it up, right? Well, this is the shocking thing because the answer is no. So if you look at this podcast, there's an article about exactly uh, revealing that, in fact, well, the Duke University is still selling these, these therapies. $15,000 a go to take your child along and get a, an injection of stem cells for their autism. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how on earth can they justify this? Or you might just note the following, that th this program is taking place as a collaboration between the, the autism uh, uh, department in in uh in duke and this company called um I can't say, cryocell and cryocell is is based uh, uh actually on the campus at at uh, uh um at duke um and it turns out this lady um uh joanna kreutzberg um is the medical director of the company that's providing the the cord blood in other words there is a very profound conflict of interest um, and they decided that they're going to risk their reputation as a serious medical school, a serious medical center, in order to keep selling these therapies. Um, it's raised a bit of a, 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 a scare amongst autism patients. There's this, uh, uh, um, uh, people are signing up uh, to try and uh, get it put, put right, um, but they've not seeded. I, I downloaded this actually this afternoon. This is taken from, uh, Duke Medical School's um, website, as you can see, they're still offering still offering this to, this this treatment. Uh, this is just one example. It's a particularly egregious one because these aren't fly by night clinics. You know, who, who are, many of whom are definitely on principle. This is a, a a respectable medical school being involved in a therapy, which I, for one, at least, think is totally unethical. Hey, that's a cheery subject, isn't it? Let's let's talk about something a bit more positive. Where, where's it going now? Let's put the feral therapies to one side. Where 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 is this this stuff going? Well, um, there's been a large number of technical breakthroughs since we did the trials that I told you about, the stroke trials that I told you about earlier. Um, and I don't have time to tell you about all of them, but there's one really pivotal one, and 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 that's the one I'd really like to spend a few moments just talking about. Um, and it involves a concept that's, uh, it's a very ugly word, but it's a very elegant concept that, that, that the words pluripotentiality, what does that mean? Well, to grapple with it, I have to introduce you to a little bit of embryology. So as you all know, uh, each life, each mammalian life, each human life starts with a fertilized egg that grows to form a ball of cells we call a morula. And then the first true differentiation event that happens during human development is, is, the, is the production of two populations of cells in what we call a blastocyst. So the outside cells, the yellow cells, they, they, the trophectoderm, and they form the placenta and all the extra embryonic membranes. But the cells we're really interested in are these little blue ones in the middle. And this is what we call the inner cell mass. And these are the pluripotent cells. These are the cells that make the entire organism. So they give rise to every cell type that makes up the embryo, the fetus, and eventually the adult body. So the whole individual is derived from these pluripotent cells, yeah? Now, people of scientists, embryologists have known about uh, pluripotency and these cells for, for donkey's years, but we didn't get very far in the study of them because we didn't have much to work with. These cells only have pluripotency for a few hours or days, and then they lose it for it never to return again during the life cycle of that organism. 
Yeah. And needless to say, there are only a few cells here. So you haven't got a biochemist, you're not giving a biochemist very much to work with. Yeah. So we didn't know very much about this property for the longest time. But the breakthrough really came about when we worked out how to culture them. So we worked out how in the 1980s, how to put these cells into, a, into a, a tissue culture and to grow them in perpetuity. So they didn't lose these stem cell properties. And these are embryonic stem cells. And I'm sure you, you've heard many times about, about embryonic stem cells. So embryonic stem cells, this technology was initially perfected with, with mouse embryos and then rats and various other species and eventually humans. So human embryonic stem cells are, are, are really quite plentiful now. When I was director of the UK Stem Cell Bank, I had, I think I had about 160 different embryonic stem cell lines that have been generated here in the UK, plus many others from overseas. Okay, but there was a problem with embryonic stem cells, an ethical problem, because to make them, you had to destroy a human embryo. And you can imagine that was never going to sit well with, with some people. And those of you who are old enough will remember that, that George W. Bush banning the use of federal funds to generate uh, these stem cell lines. So, the, so it was a breakthrough, but it was a breakthrough that didn't quite really, really totally make it. What really made the difference was the work of this gentleman, Shinya Yamanaka. In 2006, he came up with a new technology that allowed us to make human pluripotent cells starting with pretty much anything, right? So what he started with was with simply with skin cells. So he would take a simple skin biopsy, a little sort of nick of skin and grow the, the skin cells in a culture dish. And then he would use what we now call, tend to call the reprogramming factors or, or the Yamanaka factors. And what he was able to do is if you take these four factors and for the sort of cognoscenti amongst you, these are all transcription factors, you put them into the, uh, into the skin cells and what emerges? Colonies of cells indistinguishable from those embryonic stem cells I was just telling you about, okay? So pluripotent cells that can make anything. They can make any cell type in the body, literally. And here's the great thing. We uh, embryologists have been working on, on mouse development for donkey's years. And we knew with mouse cells how to make all the different cell types, not every one of them, but many of the different cell types that make up the body. Okay. And sure enough, when we tried that on the human cells, it almost all worked. So what we'd learned from the mouse was very quickly applicable to uh, the, these human cells. And so we were able to make lots of different cells, including if you're a neuroscientist, you can make brain cells. So we now suddenly had more human brain cells growing in a dish than we knew what to do with, okay? Millions of cells. You've got a plate of a billion brain, cortical brain cells. You like them, you can have another, another billion tomorrow. It was that straightforward. So it really has revolutionized cellular molecular developmental biology. And it's also made an enormous impact, as you might imagine, on regenerative medicine, because these now are the starting cells for almost all projects that are go ahead in, in, in this arena. But I just, before I go on and tell you a little bit about some, a couple of those projects, I, I just want to reinforce a point, which is this. In some ways, the most remarkable thing about these iPS cells, I haven't actually told you that, have I? That's what, so Yamanaka calls them induced pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells. So in some ways, the most remarkable thing about these pluripotent cells isn't their developmental potential, because that, you know, is sort of what we've been talking about already, is the potential to make other things, okay, which is clearly a very important property of stem cells. These cells can do something else, and it's something we've never seen before. It might be going through your mind, you know, what's new here, right? So earlier, I was telling you about cortical stem cells, the CTX OEO3 line, and they were cortical neural stem cells, and they made neurons and glia, right? So I'm now telling you that you can start with pluripotent cells make neural stem cells and they make neurons and glia. And you might think, well, where's that got us? You could already do that. What's new? What's new is the concept of histogenesis, right? The cell cells I was telling you about before, those CTX and EO3 cells, they could make neurons and glia, right? But they couldn't build tissue. They were cortical cells, but they couldn't build cerebral cortex, not like cortical cells can in vivo in the fetus, but these cells, they can. These pluripotent cells, you can start with the pluripotent cells, you can make cortical cells and they'll build you a cerebral cortex. That's what you're looking at here. So these are cortical cells that we grew in our lab um, in, in a, an explant culture. 
and they float around in little blobs of cells and they start to build a piece of cortex. So for the cognoscenti amongst you, you perhaps recognize this as a neuroepithelium, a polarized neuroepithelium. This is the apical surface, this is the basal surface. And the red cells are baby neurons that have been generated by this neuroepithelium and then migrated out to form this cortical, uh, cortical layer, just like they do in vivo. This is the cortical plate. This is baby cortical gray matter forming in a culture dish. Yeah? And I mean, some others have taken it even farther. This is a, 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 a picture from a colleague here in Cambridge, actually, uh, um, whose name suddenly escapes me. Uh, Lancaster, Madeleine Lancaster. Um, and she's taken it even farther. She can find, form these brain organoids where, where the, the, you've ended up with, with some really very highly structured and advanced uh, human brain just growing in a dish. This is a major, major area of endeavor now for neuroscientists worldwide. See how far they can push these, how many different things they can generate, how they can make it work. So it's really, really a, a terrific, uh, terrific breakthrough. I'm, uh, I don't know I'm doing for time. I, I wanna finish off then uh, with, with two examples uh, of how these pluripotent cells, ES cells, IPS cells, are revolutionizing regenerative medicine. And I'm just gonna give you two examples. And the two examples I've picked are the ones that seem to me to be the most promising and also the most advanced. They've just about now reached the clinic. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease and then about age-related macular degeneration. So Parkinson's disease, as you're all aware, is a very severe neurodegenerative disorder. It's got a very complex neuropathology. Lots of cell types uh, are affected during the, during the disease process. But the cells that attract the most attention because they seem to be pivotal in terms of the pathology that's most obvious, namely the rigidity, the, the, the dyskinesia, the, the, the slowness of movement, the inability to initiate movement. The cells that seem to be most responsible for that as this population of cells here, this little population of what we call in what we call the substantial nigra in part of the midbrain. And these are dopaminergic neurons. So these use dopamine as the transmitter, they secrete dopamine. And they have processes that spread right the way through the forebrain, the corpus striatum, all the way out to the cerebral cortex. And it's these cells that in Parkinson's disease are lost. So this entire dopaminergic projection to the corpus striatum is lost in Parkinson's disease. So the idea arises quite simply, could we replace those? Could we replace those dopaminergic neurons and restore function? Okay, so this is an old idea. And some of the feral, uh, excuse me, some of the, the, the legacy therapies that I've been talking about earlier also involved treatment of, of Parkinson's disease. The difference here, though, is that they, they work much more convincingly in patients. It was an unsuccessful trial in, in the end for reasons I'll come on to, but it did really work and gave proof of concept. And this is just one a set of scans from a patient that went through uh, this procedure. So what was done here is that fetal brain cells, again, primary fetal brain dissected from the, the midbrain of an aborted human fetus. So those cells dissected, dissociated, and, and injected into the brain of a, of a Parkinsonian patient. And what you can see here, the, the red and yellow, is this neuroimaging is what we call the fluoridopa signal. And what you're looking at are the dopaminergic terminals, those dopaminergic terminals I was telling you about in the, the part of the brain we call the corpus striatum. But you're looking at a patient, there's hardly any terminals here. There should be terminals all the way through. There should be fluoridopa signal all the way through this area, whereas there's hardly any signal left. And that's because this patient's probably lost 80, 90% of their dopaminergic neurons. Yeah. But this is that same patient one year after having received a graft of these fetal brain cells into just one, one side of the brain. You can see that the, the decrease in fluoridopa signal has continued on the unoperated side, but the side that's got the cells, there is now an increase, quite dramatically increased signal. That's after one year and after three years, well, the control side, the uninjected side, the signal's completely gone. I mean, what that tells you is this patient's disease had progressed to the point where it was incompatible with life. This patient's only alive because in the, this side, he's received, he, she, I don't know if it's male or female actually, has received a graft of, of, of these, uh, these fetal brain cells. So th this worked, but it only worked in a subset of patients. It was associated with all sorts of side effects. And the main problem with it was the logistics 
So you needed some typically between about six and eight aborted fetuses worth of cells per injection per side of the brain, right? Think of the logistics of trying to do that. Sorry, madam, you can't have your abortion this week. You're going to have to come back next week because we need the cells for the... You can't do that. You have to take the cells as and when they're available if the if the mum agrees, consents to have, have her, uh, her embryo cells used for this purpose. So it was a very, very difficult uh, programme to run. And, and um, although it had, as I've said, some successes, it was ultimately doomed to failure. And the conclusion, it's obvious. We need better cells. These cells won't do. We need something better. We've got proof of concept, but we need something better. So this is a complex side. I'm going to throw some pretty heavy biology at you now. Um, so what this is is a piece of work that appeared a couple of years ago from the Karolinska Institute. Although, let me point out uh, one, the name of one of the authors on this paper. Roger Barker is Professor of Neurology here in Cambridge. He's been a leading light worldwide uh, in this research, both clinically as a, as, a, as a clinician, but also scientifically. And, and you ever got a chance to hear Roger talk about this stuff, please go and listen to him. He's, he's outstanding. But what's happened in this in this study here is they've taken this the, the same piece of tissue. So this is that this bit of the midbrain from the from the aborted fetus. Obviously, it's a it's a diagram of it. And what's what's been done to it is what we call single cell transcriptomics. God, that's a mouthful. What do we mean by that? Well, until recently, if you wanted to know what genes cells were expressing, you analyzed the RNA in the cells, right? So you, you looked to see what RNA was in the cells, and that was an indicator which genes had been turned on. But the problem was you needed a lot of cells to make the management. So you might have a thousand, a million cells, and you'd measure the RNA in this sample of a thousand, a million cells, and you get so much of this gene, so much of this gene, so much of this gene, so on and so forth, right? But the problem's obvious. It could be that all of the cells are expressing these, these genes to these levels, or much more likely, there are some cells that are expressing a lot of this one, but none of that one, and other cells are expressing a lot of this one and not of that one, right? So you're just meaning out, averaging out that the reading across the whole population. What you really wanted to know is what each individual cell in the mix was doing, right? And until very recently, that was impossible to do. We just simply couldn't do it, but now we can. And there are lots of brain samples, not just brain, lots of, uh, of work done in cell types all through the body, where now we've got a complete readout of every gene each individual cell in a population is producing. Now, once you've got that data, you can start to say, well, these two cells in the population look the same because they're both making more or less the same genes. They're doing, making the same genes, right? They're turning on the same genes, they're doing the same job. So they're the same type of cell. Whereas these two cells, they've got a completely different set of genes expressed. They're doing a different job. They're different cells, right? So what happened in this paper was that analysis was done on this bit of this bit of the midbrain that gives rise to the dopaminergic neurons. And guess what? They found 25 different types of cells. Only one, or at least a very tiny number of which, were giving rise to the dopaminergic neurons. And yet, when they were doing these earlier studies that I just showed you, all of them, all 25 cell types were being injected into the brain. Yeah, probably plus a few others, because remember, this is a, di oops, this is a dissection from a, a, a fetus that's been through an abortion, right? Trying to sort out exactly what's what. You can imagine the gamish of cells that were being injected into those patients. But armed with this information and using clever machine learning and, 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 and all sorts of other uh, bioinformatics tricks, the, these experimenters were able to work out exactly which one of these populations was the one they really wanted, the one that really made the dopaminergic neurons that they need to be engrafted into those Parkinsonian patients, right? And armed with that information, they were able to start with a population of pluripotent cells and work out a protocol that gave exactly what they wanted, right? So now in multiple labs worldwide, this procedure is being applied. So people are able to manufacture at scale exactly the cell type they need for the, this in, the, these engraftments, yeah? And this is now going ahead. So, so uh, Roger's lab here at, at, in Cambridge is involved. There's a big European project, there's a big American project, a Japanese project, and the first patients have now been injected with cells produced in this way. We don't have any data yet, but watch this space. <laughs>
because I don't know. I, I know I've been here before, but this one's going to work. Very, very quickly, I know I'm running out of time and I should, should sit down and shut up, but let me give you one more example. This is age-related macular degeneration. So this is the retina. So again, let me remind you of the pathology here. So if you look at a normal retina, you have this population of photoreceptor cells. So these are the ones that actually receive the light, but they're very closely opposed to this population of cells we call pigment epithelium, re retinal pigment epithelium, okay? Now, in macular degeneration, what happens is this breaks down. The photoreceptors die, but they don't die because there's anything intrinsically wrong with them. They die because they no longer get the support they need from the pigment epithelium. It turns out that receiving light is a very biochemically stressful thing to do. And they need these pigment epithelial cells as support cells to enable them to, to continue that process without, without being, being damaged. So, so there, it's the retina pigment epithelium that's falling apart, but that's falling apart primarily because the layer that it normally sits on, this really thick collagenous membrane called Muck Brooks membrane, that falls apart. Yeah. So again, there were early attempts, you, what you might call legacy therapies, to try and put this right by injecting uh, the, the receptors, uh, the photoreceptors themselves, or cells that could give rise to the photoreceptors. And results were, were modest. And it's obvious why, because, okay, you're replacing the cells that you'd like to replace, but you've done nothing to repair the actual pathology. So unless you can repair the macula, the, the, the part of the back of your eye where these photoreceptors sit in high density, you're not going to be able to restore the vision. Okay. But um, so again, uh, pluripotential cells have come to the rescue. So this is work uh, originating at the Institute of Ophthalmology in London. And what they've done is, that, again, they've started with uh, pluripotent cells, in this case, embryonic stem cells. And they've worked out a procedure how to make retinal pigment epithelium. Okay. And not only can they make pure retinal pigment epithelium, they can grow it as an actual monolayer. OK, and that's enabled them to do something that's only really just getting started in this field. And that is put them together with a structural component that will give them the properties they really require. So what they've done with this retinal pigment epithelium is they've grown it on an artificial Brooks membrane. So that allows them to make what they call a patch. So this is a few millimeters by a few millimeters. And what it is, is basically a plastic, obviously a, a, a plastic made in approved clinical uh, material on which they've grown a layer of pure uh, retinal pigment epithelium. And they've also, so they've invented that, they've also invented a device because uh, this device needs to be in, it placed right at the back of the eye in the, in the macula. And so a surgeon needs a device to, to place that precisely in the right place. I should also say they also had to, to invent a pig model of macular degeneration so they could test all of this. They couldn't test it on a, on a, on a rodent in the conventional way because it's much too big. Obviously, this is a, a, a patch designed for, for humans. So they tested it first on, pig, on pigs. And here it is. So they've now done two patients. So you can see this as a scan of the back of the eye on, on both of these two patients progressively. And you can see the patch really quite clearly. And what you, you can see, although you have to be an expert to read, is, is that the pigment epithelium are spreading over this, over this patch and repopulating it. And they are forming the basis then for the, in, in, uh, uh, the ingrowth of, of new photoreceptor cells, which the retina can in, themselves sort of uh, grow in. So that's the technology, that's the approach. Is it working? Well, these are the first two patients that they've done. And what you're looking at here is again, time along the x-axis. This is visual acuity measured basically the same way as you would have visual acuity measured if you go to the optician. You know, how many letters can you read off a, off a chart? And what you can see is this patient, uh, visual acuity through the one eye. I should say in each case, both eyes were affected, but they only operate one eye, the, the worse of the two eyes, the less good of the two eyes. This patient was effectively blind in this eye, visual acuity essentially of zero. Uh, but you can see over the, th these are days of the study, visual acuity is qu really quite dramatically improved. And similarly with this one, initially, uh, again, almost zero visual acuity, uh, but over time, uh, there's been a considerable improvement. So again, two patients, 
we've already learned the, the danger of extrapolating too far from very small numbers of patients. But nonetheless, this is obviously very, very encouraging. But the thing I want to accent about this is how much more sophisticated this is. You know, this is a, enabling uh, uh, people to, to manufacture a clear medicinal product, a, a product, you know, it's, it's a membrane with, with purified, identified cells stuck to the membrane, a device for administering it, a manufacturing process for producing both of those both of those components. It's much more sophisticated. I mean, the I mean, I, I showed you that picture, didn't I, of our stroke trial with this patient with this enormous great uh, apparatus attached to their their head, so we could direct the injection into the brain really quite precisely. It all looks very sophisticated until you think that what we're doing here is just sort of squirting a slurry of cells into a brain. I mean. Can you think of a less sophisticated way of integrating cells into a structure as complex as the human brain by just you know, injecting them into, into the brain? Here, we're building a device that's got this, 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 this substrate, this proper component, and an actual layer, an actual tissue layer. So I'm very much more optimistic that these, these more advanced approaches will work. So that's everything I wanted to tell you. So uh, I, I think I've, I've talked to you for you sort of <laughs> 30 years of, of, uh, of, of, of brain repair attempts. And as you can see, we, the early attempts, have, we've learned a lot from them, albeit that mostly they failed. They've unfortunately spawned also these, these off the wall attempts. And I told you about the autism case. But I think, I, I hope I've made the case that some of the, the, the newer approaches, the more um, uh, clever approaches really are looking much more promising. Ah, uh, oh, John's already give you a, a um, uh, an advert for my book, but there it is. Also, I've got a, a blog, and if anybody's interested, I talk about some of these some of these topics uh, in that. So, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll finish there. Did I go on too long? No, not at all. That was great, Jack. Thank you very much indeed. That was brilliant. Um, so are there any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> There's one. <clears throat> it's on, it's on, John. There's, there's one here first. Getting instructions on how to use it. Um, it seems to be like you've got an um, unorganizational problem, as it were. So you, you're sort of, in a way, expecting cells to self-organize. Um, and uh, it strikes me that the most successful um, application was one where the organ was very diffuse. So, so blood being, being the example where there's um, uh, sort of quite a diffuse organ. And, yeah. um, so... Do we have any sort of measure um, for every functional cell? Of course, we've got a lot of supporters. It's like a, a team with a, a striker and um, a lot of other so cells that that um, uh, allow this the cell to continue and so on. Um, do we have any sort of measure of uh, for every functional cells how, how many supporting cells we have? Yes. Um, um, it's. I think it's a difficult question to answer. So. What, one of the concepts I haven't talked about, which is very important in stem cell biology, is people now talk about a stem cell niche. Uh, and what we know is that a lot of the properties of the cells, the stem cells, aren't embodied just in the cells themselves. They're embodied in the interactions of the, uh, of the cells and, and, and the niche in which they fit and the blood vessels, that they, the connective tissue, everything that surrounds them. Uh, and there's a lot of work going on into that now, um, particularly in things like the bone marrow, where people are realizing the niche plays an important role. Um, we know a lot about the the niche in neural stem cells as well. The ones that I haven't talked about those, but all adult, all of us have uh, have stem cells in certain parts of our brain, and we know a lot about the niche there and the kind of support cells that you need and how that works. But I, I, you're right to observe that that. In these therapeutic applications, it's a bit hit and miss. We don't really know what we need. 
Um, and our approach of just squirting them in wasn't very sophisticated, but frankly, we didn't know how much how to do much better. The, the, the retinal example is a much better example because there we do know what the relationships are. We know that it's those pigment epithelial cells that are important. So they've been included, as it were, in, in the experiment. But I think you put your finger on exactly one of the issues. How does one know how best to decorate the cell, how best to embody the cell such that it can go on and do the job? And, and I think a lot more work's got to be done on that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Yes. Certainly very enlightening for someone that hasn't done very much biology. <laughs> um, but... Um, First of all, retinitis pigmentosa. We have a member of the family that yes. suffers from this, um, which is a somewhat rarer than macular yes. degeneration. And <clears throat> is work going on in a similar vein? Is it? Is there some read across from yeah. from that? Yeah. Um, that's my first point. And yeah. secondly, stabilizing the patient after a stroke. Yes. Um, in other words, getting rid of the blood clot. Yes. Obviously, you need blood to is it to feed the cells um, yes. that you uh, later on. So, is the procedure first of all to unblock the patient, and is there a chance that you could introduce through the bloodstream to target that particular area that yes. was damaged? Yes. Both very good questions. So to answer your first one, yes, there absolutely is. Retinitis pigmentosa is another target, and there's a lot of cell therapies being developed for that. Um, I haven't come across any in, in my sort of more advanced category of late. There was certainly a lot of the earlier legacy therapies were, were, were of that, were, were into retinitis uh, pigmentosa. Um, actually, Renewal on the company that I work with, although I'm not involved with them anymore, are developing a therapy for that as well. So yes, there's 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 a lot going on in that regard. Um, your second question, yes. So um, there's an important distinction to be made. So there's a lot of therapies, both conventional therapies and some cell therapies being developed for, for the acute response to stroke. So as you say, initially, there's a lot of effort goes into trying to release the blockage so that the blood supply can be restored. Uh, so an acute approach, and, and you, you'll be aware of, of sort of clot busting drugs and, and things like that. They have to be administered very, very soon because once the, the, t the brain tissue has died, uh, obviously, you know, even if you clear the, the vessel, you, you're not gonna bring it back to life. Um, and, and then some cell therapies, some companies have tried to inject the, the therapy really immediately following the stroke and, and, and again have a neuroprotective effect, try and protect the, 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 uh, the tissue that's at risk, try and protect it so it doesn't die. Uh, and there's been some success along those lines. Our study wasn't that. You perhaps noticed that all of our patients were at least six months post-stroke before we so ours was very much to to uh, our therapeutic target was stroke disability it's after the disability has been established we were trying at that point to reverse it so it, it was a different approach from the more acute approaches um, much for the interesting talk i was wondering in addition to the disease that you studied such as stroke um would this re brain repair using stem cells apply to other kind of um, diseases, neuro-related diseases, such as epilepsy? Yeah, um, yeah like wider kind of disease yeah. range. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I focused on these two because uh, well, I suppose we could say my favorites. Uh, the, you know the, the the ophthalmology and the and and the uh, Parkinson's disease. I mean they're the most advanced, but but th there are there are other studies going on on a whole range of other things. Uh, epilepsy um, is an interesting one. There was quite a lot of research uh, some years ago. Epilepsy is is an odd uh, condition in some ways. It's considered to be an imbalance between. I don't know how much neuroscience you know, but there are there are there are uh, 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 there are uh, neurons that, that have a positive effect on other neurons and others have a negative effect you know there are a plus and minus and they have to be in balance and, and what happens in epilepsy it's believed is that there's a lack a lack of the of the negative cells the cells that inhibit other other neurons and so the idea might be that you could actually 
put more of those cells back into the brain and restore the balance. And there is quite a lot of animal data to suggest that might work. I, I haven't seen any human data. As far as I know, that hasn't got to the clinic yet. But I mean, the answer to your question, though, is yes, absolutely. The, the examples I've picked are just examples. They're not, uh, they're not the only ones out there. Hi. Yes, just yep. talking to the top. Okay. Um, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I'll do my best, but I don't know all the words. <laughs> Pluripotent stem cells. So how do you make them become uh, uh, neural? Yes. Well, it's a very good. It's a very good question. Yes, absolutely. Well, what you do is you mimic what happens in the embryo. And what happens in the embryo is the cells talk to each other. So uh, basically, a, a cell in the embryo takes on a particular identity, takes on a particular fate on the basis of where it is in the embryo and its history. So where it is in the embryo means it gets exposed to influences from this cell, that cell, this other um, things that we call morphogens, which are signaling molecules. And they tell the cell, what you do now is you turn on these genes and that leads you to do this. And we've been studying embryology, well, in humans, but primarily in, 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 in other, other vertebrate species, particularly mice, for donkey's years. And so we had a very, very good idea of if you want to make a neuron, what you need to do is do this and then this and this. So what you do is you start with the embryonic stem cells or the iPS cells. And firstly, you have to make them sort of ectoderm because believe it or not, the brain is derived from the ectoderm, the layer that gives rise to skin. So first of all, we have to tell them to be ectoderm, but then you have to tell them to be neurectoderm, the kind of ectoderm that's going to become brain. And then you tell them they've got to be forebrain, the front bit or midbrain or hindbrain or spinal cord and then you tell them and then you tell them and then you tell so it's a whole succession of signals where you, you take it from the pluripotent state right the way through to what whoops the, the, the final thing you want to end up with so it's, it's quite involved uh but at the same time it's quite precise i mean you know this is what how evolution does it this is how evolution built you know built us <laughs> so it's a question of, of mimicking it Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm still bothered about how the the rat brain yeah. experiment worked so well. Yeah. And trying to do the same with human cells didn't work so well. Is it yeah. just a case of the numbers or the plumbing or, or what? Well, I, I'm tempted to say if we knew the answer to that question, we'd put it right. <laughs> um, Instincts then. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, it, it's really difficult. I mean, let me let me give you one, one, one statistic. So clinical trials, and I'm not meaning stem cell clinical trials, I'm talking conventional medicines, right? 90% of them fail. Okay. And so these are, you know, this, these are pharmaceutical companies who know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how to make medicines. And they, they're using tests they've used over and over and over again, verified, validated, so on and so forth. They go into patients, 90% of them fail, okay? And it's partly we know why, but really in the end, it's just a bit of a, it really is a bit of a mystery. Uh, animal experiments really are very, very poor approximations to human disease, as, you know, all the antivivisectionists will tell you. Unfortunately, it's the best we've got. Um, and, and the trouble is that there is a thousand variables. There really is a thousand variables, you know, which patients should get them, how many cells, where should you put them? Um, you know, it, it, it really does. It really is really very, very difficult to, to, uh, to work your way through. And you don't get lucky in science. You know, you have to do the hard yards. You have to do it over and over and over again and work out this variable, that variable until you nail it down. So it, it's hard. Uh, that isn't much of an answer, <laughs> except, but it's the only one we've got. Well, it looks like there are no more questions and it's nine o'clock, which is our guillotine. Oh, so right. um, 
Thank you again, Jack. That was marvellous. You're welcome. Talk. Thank you.